I'm very often asked, uh, is there anything that he feared? And what he feared was mediocrity. And I'm very glad that he always succeeded in avoiding mediocrity. He didn't think it was necessary to make a film, and a lot of films are being made, yeah, plenty of them. So um, he didn't want to just add a movie. Uh, he had to be totally in love with the subject matter. That was very important. And out of this love and passion came knowledge. So it was a slow process. It was, it, it was not a, for him, not a, the, the normal manufacturing process. But it, it, it was a, a work of art where, which requires an artist. Uh, I, I, I sometimes say it very simply, uh, no artist, no art, and no love, no quality. Now, you know, the, the, sometimes people speak about the art of film production. There is no such thing. Film production is a manufacturing process. It's very similar to building a house yeah, or, or to manufacture anything else. The artist has to be brought into it. Uh, you know, there are films without artists that are perfectly fine and they're successful and they're not a work of art, but it doesn't really matter. You know, who, who makes a film? That's the first question. Who is actually a filmmaker? And uh, there's no doubt. Uh, it is, you know, the people of, the person of a producer, writer, and director uh, will be amalgamated in the director. In, in the very end, it's the director alone. He is the filmmaker. And, uh, you know, and this is the kind of film I'm talking about. Mm. Is, no committee has ever made a great work of art. No committee has ever written a symphony or did a great painting or wrote a novel. And the same is true for a great film. An Ingmar Bergman film is made by Ingmar Bergman, by himself. I remember I had a trip once with Sven Nyquist, this wonderful cinematographer, who, um, uh, from, from uh, Ariflex to the airport, and I congratulated him because he got an Oscar, I think, for, for uh, Fanny and Alexander, and he said, oh, don't congratulate me. He said, it's Ingmar Bergman's film. I'm only the cinematographer. Yeah, the, the, that's an interesting attitude, and, and of course, I share this very much. So um, sometimes people tell me very naively, oh, well, you have now worked for 30 years with such a great master and such a great teacher. Isn't it about time you make a feature film? And I can only say, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to see a feature film I have made. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, forget it. Yeah? I mean, I've, I've made documentaries. That's a totally different matter. It's a very different matter, very different matter. That's a question of diligence and having a feeling for flow and really using other, other material. But to make a feature film, uh, and if you have the ambition of being a great film, that's a very, very different matter, and I wouldn't touch it. Um, you know, it's so easy to make a film. Mm. Very easy. I mean, look at this equipment now, very cheap and very efficient, and, you know, you, you I mean, you know, if you, if, if you, I mean, it, it, 30, 40 years ago, it was very, very expensive because you needed a lab and, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's very easy. But to make a good film, is as difficult as it always was. And to make a good film that other people want to see, now you add another element of difficulty. And a great film is almost a miracle. Yeah. Like any great work of art, like any great symphony or any great painting or great works of architecture. And yeah, a, a film art is so new. It's barely 100 years old. And it was added to many, many hundred years of established art forms, which is basically architecture, that's the oldest, and then painting, and music composing, and of course writing. And film is brand new. And uh, all of the others, 95% of all things, even more, disappear. But the great works are our reference points for the past. We wouldn't know anything, really, of substance, of the, the life of the 18th century or the 19th century without uh, uh, Dickens or, or, or before that uh, Shakespeare or the great painters or whatever. We wouldn't. It's the artist first. You think of Baroque, Bach, Handel, all right. You know, wh whatever it is, it's always the artist first. And three beats later, it's the history and the battles and the politicians and all that stuff. So, yeah. Art in film is an incredibly important element, but it is also quite clear that it is very, very difficult, and that basically it's an industry, it's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it is entertainment, and Shakespeare was a great entertainer. 
Yeah? Entertainment is not a bad word at all. Yeah? Entertainment doesn't make it cheaper. It has to be entertainment, otherwise no audience. <laughs> that, that, that's a problem. Yeah. So, what he feared was mediocrity. Yeah, it, um, I mean, I suppose after 2001, because it, it was an artistic triumph, um, eventually, I mean, it, eventually. Eventually. It was saved by teenagers. Uh, exactly. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> saved by teenagers, no um, question. I mean, young men were the key audience for 2001. People over 40, hmm, not yeah. really. And critics, really some hated it. Yeah, and boring, like the first 20 minutes, nothing happens. You know, what did he mind? And this black slab at the end, what on earth is this about? Well, 14 year old, 14 year olds understood it very well yeah. and wrote love letters to Stanley. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's a very, very interesting that, that children very often have an ability to understand something that, uh, and grown ups don't. Did MGM executives look at it when it was 2000? Oh, they were horrified. I know at the premiere, the famous. Story. It was also the wrong, the wrong premiere. I mean, to, to defend that, uh, it was it was what he, what Sandy called the the, the mink stolen Cadillac audience, yeah, you know, York, <laughs> yeah. and and that is of course not the right audience. But yeah. then the next day it opened and and people came and it was a huge hit. Yeah. But it was really a huge hit made by young people. I mean, let's say under 35, yeah? Uh, Nobody can outguess the audience. Nobody knows no, but what... executives think they can. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> it's a, and, and Stanley Kubrick had the freedom. Now, he gained this, he, he deserved it mm. uh, after, after, you know, have, he has proven with, with Dr. Strangelove that uh, you can make a, a very, very uh, serious comedy <laughs> <laughs> about a very serious topic, and it is hugely successful. Mind you, many people hated him for it. Yeah? Yeah. That's okay. another story. But uh, so, and he gained that freedom, and it was one of his conditions that they would leave him alone, and they did. And they did, they took the risk, and okay, off you go. Right? Yeah. Now, when the film came out, uh, they were horrified because they didn't understand it. Maybe there are a few exceptions, and then when it was successful. But you know, this happens today. What is you now your specific question on Clockwork Orange? I didn't quite on, get on that. On Clockwork Orange, oh, yeah, what, how, what, he, how he successfully adapted a, a sort of revolutionary literary work. With a scissor um, and glue. Um, yeah, it's no, a book written in the first person. Yeah, it's, but he made it into a film that was equally groundbreaking in sort of visual and cinematic terms. Uh, I'm sure he's a great filmmaker. Yeah. I, I know, but I would not, I mean, I would not want to adapt Ulysses, for instance. It no, he was very faithful to Burgess. Oh, absolutely. So, he's very faithful to Burgess. He used the same language. It's first, pers first person yeah, spoken absolutely. with narration and first person speaking on the screen. So uh, it's a, you know, you know the story, so I don't have to tell you. So the um, difficulty was to show this disgusting violence mm -hmm. in a way which still is absolutely you know, off-putting, because it has to be, but artistically stylized. And he did this in this ballet form. Mm. Um, mm. Many people were very upset about it, and they, sh they should be. You know, uh, you said, oh, well, how can you show a rape which is so disgusting? I said, well, because it is. You know, I mean, do you want me to show it so that it is actually not so bad? <laughs> you know, no, uh, I think it's a very powerful film. And uh, well, he, he, follow, he followed the basic dramatic rules which, he, which we have learned from Shakespeare already. You have a beginning uh, which you should start right away. Yeah, if, if at all possible. And if you have anything beforehand, it has to be relevant to what follows. It has to tie into the end, and in the middle, you develop these two points. And if you look at Stanley's films, he was always very, very careful to stick to this very basic dramatic rule. I mean, take Full Metal Jacket. Instantly start with the humiliation of a young man, cut their hair off, shout at them. Yeah? And, and uh, so that, that, that's how the film opens. And uh, it ends there glad to go home, and they're dreaming of their girls. Hey, 
That's life. They were lucky they, to get away with it. So, or take uh, uh, any other film you like. It all, all, uh, 2001. It, it, what's the track? The track is the monolith. The monolith begins the film. The monolith goes with it through the story. And at the end, you have a repeat of the beginning. It's basically, you know, so it's like Titanic, take the diamond away and you've got no, no script. <laughs> yeah, the diamond is the track, yeah, from begin all the time. Take it away, what, what, what do you tell the actors? Yeah, and um, so this is very, very important to, to sort it out beforehand. As I always tell students, a film begins with pen and paper. Forget the camera and all that stuff. It's, you've got to sit down and figure out what do you really want to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what Stanley did, and that's why it took a long time, because he has prepared many other things and abandoned them. He fell out of love. That's the right word, actually, because it was great passion. And then it didn't work, and he dropped it. Yeah, or he changed his mind. I mean, we worked for a year on AI, and then he offered it to Stephen. And the, the Napoleon fell. Oh, no, was that his, was that his dream project. A dream was, project. I mean, he was an expert on this on this man. And what um, yeah, what, what fascinated him about Napoleon is that you have this mixture of an unbelievable genius, incredibly talented, was a general at age twenty. Can you imagine? And at the same time, he was an egocentric, vain fool, and threw everything away that he had achieved. That interested Stanley because that's what happens today. Yeah. yeah, it's relevant for us today. Nothing has changed. Human nature now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if if our society goes goes under, it's our fault. It's not even global warming. Yeah. <laughs> Every generation has great artists. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. But I meet young students. I know this is a guy or a girl. I I couldn't even touch them. Um, they are so much more talented than I am, yeah? and it's wonderful to see that, but not in abundance. One of those seminars which I do is on the short film as a calling card, mm. because yeah, it's very difficult. The short film today, because you can't make any money with short films, nobody can, but it serves you to prove I am talented, mm -hmm. provided it does that. Yeah? Now, I have two... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, provided it does that. And then I have now two examples. There's one girl in Israel. She made an amazing short film, and she got the money to do a feature. A young man in uh, Slovakia, in Bratislava, an incredible short film. He got the money to do a feature. So he proved talent. So I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. Who am I? Yeah. What do I know? But these are practical experiences. So I think, I, can, I think today for a young film student or young filmmaker, it's very important that he does a short film which floors you. Mm. If, he, if he can do that, then uh, it, it's a big, big break point. But this happens on pen and paper, yeah. heart and brain. It has nothing to do with equipment and, and production value and all that stuff. Yeah? It has to really, it comes from a totally different angle. If you really have something to say, I, I can show you a short film that has a zero budget mm. and is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah? So uh, that's, uh, that's wonderful, isn't it? So, and, and there are great people around. There There's are, no there are doubt about it. And some of them are going to make it. And more films are being made, and uh, there will be good films. Uh, but it's the audience that determines the success. In fact, I'm quoting uh, uh, the old master Fritz Lang, you know, who was once asked by a student, what are, what are the three most important things to make a great film? He said, well, you only need three things. You need a great script, a great script, and a great script. Now, I, I told this to Stanley Kubrick, right? And he said, oh, yeah, I know the story, it's an old hat. I would put it differently. So what would you say? You need a great beginning, a great ending, and something very good in between. So it's another, <laughs> yeah, so, 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 yeah, it, it's very, very, very difficult to say that. But what I said before, and I, I, that is also, I can only repeat it, a filmmaker is the amalgamation of script, producer, and himself. In the end, 
it's the director who is in charge. You know, that's, it's, it, Woody Allen said it so beautifully in an interview. He, he said, oh, when Manhattan was out, I hated the film. It was terrible. And I pleaded with United Artists. I told them I'd make a film for them for nothing if they just withdraw it and not distribute it. They did. It's a masterpiece. It's hugely successful. That's Woody Allen. That's what I mean by artists being so self-critical. Another thing that Woody Allen said is, oh, it's very easy to write on, a, on your paper and you think you're all in love with it and it's wonderful, you think it's going to be another Citizen Kane, and then, you know, <laughs> and then you stand on the floor next to the camera and you are thinking, I would prostitute myself to avoid this catastrophe <laughs> that is staring me in the eye. You know? I mean, yeah, uh, this is the other side. So, and Kubrick said it beautifully. He was asked, what is the most difficult thing to make a film? And he quoted Steven Spielberg. He said, Steven said the following, and I totally agree, the most difficult thing making a film is getting out of the car. <laughs> because you are all totally alone. You may have a crew of 20 people or 250. That depends on the project. There they are. There's there they are, 8 o'clock call, everybody is there. The actors are made up and hairdresser, everything's ready. So uh, you're the director, now go ahead. What do you want? What, what shall we do? Hmm? So it, it's tough, it's tough. And I mean, I've observed it really firsthand, this, this, this wrestling for quality, not making a compromise. Hmm. It, it, did I answer your question a little yeah, bit? A little much? It's difficult. It's really difficult to make a good film. And I respect it enormously. Uh, you know, it took so long because it took forever in the cutting room until he was really happy with it. And he tried everything out. He was, you know, he was not fast. And he didn't think things would fall into his lap. You know, some people said he was a genius. Yeah? And he said, yeah, if, if they just knew how much work it was, you know. And, and he loved uh, uh, this famous quote uh, 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 from Johann Sebastian Bach, who was really called a genius often, and he was one, and he said, yeah, fine, it's 10% talent, 90% hard work. It's incredibly uh, uh, difficult to, uh, to fight all, all the elements also in, in, in yourself by being disciplined. It needs so much discipline to make a good film and not get carried away. You get, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's another element. No, I mean, I, I really observed this. And I'm perfectly, per, personally so very glad that he considered Eyes Wide Chart his greatest contribution to the art of filmmaking. Um, uh, most, most people wouldn't agree with that, but it doesn't really matter. It's the artist himself that has to uh, be happy with it. And and 2001, I mean, yeah, he always he always liked that film. I, I remember, yeah, it, it was uh, he was very very happy that young people at the time uh, really rescued him, uh, and this was because of the spiritual aspect of the film. I mean, Kubrick was not religious, but he had an enormous respect for life and for the miracles that we are. <laughs> and that are around us. And this is all expressed in, in 2001, you know, the, the, the great admiration for the unknowable. And that really hit 12-year-old and 14-year-old boys very hard. This is interesting, yeah. yeah? If you take so much time as he did, if you're so slow and so careful, you have to balance this with having a minimum of normal overhead costs. It's as simple as that, or you go broke. I mean, this famous scene in, in Eyes Wide Shut when uh, Nicole does her monologue, sitting on the floor, yeah? She was in a cubicle, Tom was sitting on the bed, Stanley was outside that room, uh, looked on a monitor, the camera was on an arm inside, remote control, and they just went off. And uh, she just talked, and, and sometimes the thousand foot magazine ran out, okay, you know, reload and go again. And then, okay, it's all done. It's all finished. She did it beautifully. And then Stanley says, it was brilliant. Let's, let's try that, do that again, and do whatever you want. Yeah? And, and that's how you sometimes get things which you never expect also from actors. But for that, you need time. If you now, at that moment, put pressure on, hurry up, hurry up, not a chance in hell to do that.
He didn't like to travel. I did the traveling. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like to travel, and he, he, never went, he never left actually England in 30 years. Once to Ireland for Barry Lyndon, and once to, to Germany for a family uh, 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 gathering. That was it. Yeah, he, he never went back. He, he hated flying, although he had a pilot's license as a young man and flew himself as a, as a photo reporter for Look magazine. Uh, but anyway, so yeah. Um, this is true, and the British press, of course, slaughtered him because he never talked to them. And you know, if they, they, he constantly was asked by journalists to give an interview or do a radio, and he always said, "Terribly sorry, he doesn't do that." And then they wrote terrible things about this misanthrope and this. And of course, he never defended himself. And I told yesterday somebody. Uh, that there was one instance when somebody absolutely stupid article about him, and I went to his office and said, "Look, let me talk to this guy." He said, and he said, "Oh, for heaven's sakes, don't! You never get rid of them." <laughs> that was his attitude. Yeah. Well, right or wrong, you know, uh, I think he was also a bit wrong in that respect because he caused a lot of problems by 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 being so so shy away from the press. He, he always he talked to Richard Schickel, and he talked to Alexander Walker, and he talked to um, uh, yeah, two, three guys, always the same. He, he knew them, and he was fairly comfortable. And he had to do something after each film for Warner Brothers, of course, otherwise it's very strange. Yeah? But he didn't enjoy that. I mean, yeah, he didn't disrespect them. He was an avid newspaper reader. He was extremely well informed. He just didn't like to give explanations to his films. He, he really didn't. And, and yeah, yeah, so uh, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, and now the, the question of, of small crew. I mean, uh, you know, eyes wide shut, fine. Big change in plan. These guys, or these voyeurs, this so called orgy, nothing to do with an orgy at all. It was, a, in, in his vision, a modern hell. This was a modern hell. Super rich people co creating their own hell, like Hieronymus Bosch has painted it. Right? So, and they had half masks, as he said. Well, it doesn't make any sense, half masks. We need full masks, because they don't want to recognize each other next morning at a board meeting. Right? So, and then, OK, I went to Venice. I bought every mask in myself. Is that the job of an executive producer? Yes, if you work for Kubrick. <laughs> 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 because, <laughs> yes, because everybody had to do everything. We were so few people, but I loved it. It was wonderful, totally, you know, really hands-on. On, on, on The Shining, for example, before we started filming, we had all the second unit. You know, the stuff in the winter, when you see the hotel, Doug Milsom and myself, period. That was the crew, and one Aeroflex. Yeah, we went to this tim Timberline Lodge in Oregon. There was this hotel. We had to wait. Had a wonderful time in the day, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> had, a, yeah, had to wait for virgin snow. No tracks because it was a ski hotel, right? So, and then we got up very, very early, got around, got with a 2C and a, and a, and a 50 or 35 F, at F2, waiting for ex getting an exposure at F2. We had in our two bedrooms. We had lower lights with lots of tracing paper. So, and then the moment you get an exposure, we filmed it. That was it. That is raw filmmaking, very cheap. Once we had that, these were the reference points. And whenever you see an actor, it, it was done in Elster Studios in, in, in London. I mean, it was not extravagant. The great extravagance was always that we spent so much time. I was a member of the crew, you know. I didn't, you know, nothing that you see on the screen or that you hear is me. Nothing. I made deals, I negotiated, I organized, I did what he wanted. I, I, I don't take any credit. The only, that had no, I had nothing to do with the artistry. The only thing I did on the side was a fun job, is I suggested music. That was always sort of my domain, but I didn't choose it. I suggested it. Yeah, and I loved that role. I had no responsibility. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know it was wonderful, but I, I must make that quite clear that uh, while I, I made lots of deals and negotiated and got permissions and got rights and all this, it's because that's what he needed. 
Yeah, uh, he made, it was his film. I, 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 there's no question about it. Did you have to follow up? Did you have to play interference with some of the, you know, the uh, production houses and the people investing in the films? It was Warner Brothers. I, I don't know anything. I was 100% Warner Brothers. Everything. That's all I know. I've never made a film with anybody else. And when I did the documentary on Kubrick, it was Warner Brothers. And when I did the documentary on Malcolm McDowell, it was Warner Brothers. I made a few other documentaries independent, that's true, but they were very cheap films. And I enjoyed that very much. I made a film around the Dvorak Cello Concerto with an international youth orchestra. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. What we did after, after um, Stanley had died, quite, quite a number of years later, is that the Frankfurt Film Institute came to us and suggested to make a big exhibition on him. And I felt, well, big exhibition on Kubrick should be in New York or in London. What does he have to do with Frankfurt? But nobody came from New York and London. Not to this day, I'm afraid. And uh, so they pushed very hard. The German government also then uh, backed them up with, with certain financial guarantees. And they said their the attitude was that Kubrick was a world artist, like Picasso or Stravinsky, it has nothing to do with any country. So, well, all right, well, finally we gave in and we started it, and it was a big hit. It went after Frankfurt to Berlin, then to Melbourne in Australia, very good. And in the meantime, it was in Rome and Paris. And, uh, Amsterdam and Z Zurich and Ghent and the last two stations were Los Angeles. It was fantastic. 242,000 visitors in Los Angeles at LACMA. Then to Sao, uh, Sao Paulo after that. And now we open on the 4th of May in Krakow and on the 27th of October in Toronto. And we are now negotiating with Seoul and, and uh, in, in Korea and, and the results. So it will go on and on and on and on. Yeah. Huge exhibition, beautifully done, and uh, yeah, you need about 10,000 square feet of, of space and high ceilings, and no, it's a really good job. Kubrick never threw anything away. So we, we have an enormous amount of professional archive of uh, drafts, of scripts, etc. Um, Mr. Horvath, again, thank you so much oh, for your welcome. time. Thank you for coming to Bermuda, and thank you um, for coming here tonight to talk to us um, on this subject. And, um... <laughs>